Good afternoon, EMF puny mortals. Uh, this was all a little bit last minute. I don't have a hammer. The hammer isn't for servicing. I have a sword. I will be using this sword to keep rigorous time of our four or five fantastic speakers. You are going to have an amazing time. Think of this as a smorgasbord of knowledge. You are my kind of people. You want the grazing plate. You don't, want to, you don't want to be in one room just listening about one thing for 45 minutes. No, you want a selection. So, without further ado, may I introduce our first speaker, EMX. Hello, hello. Hi there. My name's Chris. Uh, I'm one of the leads of the null sector. Uh, you may remember in 2018 when we were here for the first time, we had null sector down that kind of way, near the lake. Kuku camping is up there. So we're getting around the site. <laughs> that kind of stuff was, uh, was, 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 was fine on foot. Uh, in 2022, we moved null sector down the other end of the site. So it's literally the furthest point from the food in the crew camp to null sector and back again. Uh, and I wanted some transport. And I can't remember what came first than the fact that I found a website called Leaf Bike, which will sell you an e-bike kit for basically any shaped bike you want, or going to the dump and finding a BMX frame that looked like it had been utterly unloved, and thought, hmm, maybe you can combine these two. Um, and I was looking around, and I was like, OK, the <laughs> conversion kits are reasonably expensive. And then the version kits with a big battery attached to them are even more expensive. But I've got a lot of Makita tools, so why don't I just <laughs> strap six Makita batteries to the top of a BMX and go flying down the hill and you know, what could go wrong? And it turns out a lot of things can go wrong. Uh, so this, this kit that it comes with is, uh, well, to put it in context, I think the UK limit for uh, e-bikes is a 250 watt motor on the back. This is 10 times that. The, the wheels are nice and small, so it's very, very torquey, and it's basically a kid's bike, and I'm not a kid, so all of my weight is back here. Uh, myself and many of my mates who have tried this spend most of the first five meters of our journey on one wheel, the back one, just kind of flying along. Uh, but it's a lot of fun, uh, and it turns lots of heads, and it's a great conversation starter at EMF. But it's also interesting, right? We've got all these batteries on here, this is obviously a standard for a tool battery. Uh, and of course, if you've got a DeWalt or other, other tool brand, you can't use these. But you can get adapters. But here, there's a need for a small, kind of, a small container of energy. In an e-bike, you've got a small container of energy on the lawnmower. You have this still, the same stuff as the electrification of everything kind of keeps on going. Surely we need more standards, right? Why, why can't I do this and it not be a janky piece of, <laughs> you know? Why can't I do this properly? If I had a proper bike, a commuter bike, if I was a workman, I could charge up a load of batteries, ride to like a work site with those batteries, drill some holes, cut some OSB up, and then cycle back with those same batteries. They're just, you know, they're just batteries, right? So it'd be interesting to see there's starting to become more standards around tool batteries. You can obviously get adapters and, uh, and such. I wonder if we'll see something like this, maybe not quite like this, uh, in the future. That is my talk. Thank you for coming to it. Thank you very much, Chris. I have now got one minute and 47 seconds to fill, which I was not anticipating. I do not have enough material for this scenario. So I am instead going to go, I haven't got enough hands. Where is Zafel Bieberbrox when you need him? Um, next up, we have got Funky Plus. So we're gonna Chris with you this. It's gonna be next, next slide, please. Awesome. All right, please give it up for our next speaker. You can take that. Good 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Dave Johnson. Um, I represent AMSAT UK. We're the uh, organisation that uh, launches, designs and builds uh, small amateur satellites. And, we, and I do mean that we do actually put them into space. Um, we've been around for about uh, 25 years. I've been doing this for more than 50 years. You can tell from the grey hair. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, as, um, we've, uh, the organisation I'm involved with has launched um, one satellite. We've licensed two more. Those, li those licenses have actually allowed us to actually build three more. So we've been extremely lucky. Um, we're now talking to the CAA, which is the uh, UK organisation for uh, launch in the UK, which is my role in the organisation. Next, please. So we've moved on from uh, one small satellite to about five. We're now moving on to our next set. And I'll show you what the sort of size of this thing is. This is called a CubeSat. That's two cubes. Imagine three cubes or six cubes or 12 cubes. That's the sort of size of thing. They're, they're very modular. Um, we've built um, the first uh, flat sat, basically the uh, design of the uh, device. We'll then move it into an engineering model and then into the flight model. And we're talking to um, SpaceX for a launch in uh, 2025. Um, so we're ever hopeful that so that's going to happen. These things do slip. That's the, that's the size of the uh, device. What goes into it are a set of boards uh, like this, a stack of uh, PCBs. Same form factor, 10 by 10 by 10, or a multiple of that. Um, this particular piece I'm holding is our engineering model, or something we take into schools for uh, demonstrations for STEM outreach. Next slide, please. We design our own boards. Um, we've got a, skill set, a very, very skilled set of engineers, uh, RF engineers, mechanical engineers. But we also have to have these tested, of course, uh, going to a space environment. Um, there are organisations in the UK which have been uh, set up to do this. Um, some of the boards you can see there have been tested at uh, Rutherford Appleton Labs. Um, a, a, a PCB, when it's being tested, will, will flex, of course. Um, the uh, worst ever rating we have on one of our boards was 96G for about 100 milliseconds. We took it off the test rig and shook it. Nothing had fallen off, fortunately. <laughs> Next, please. Um, as well as um, sensing the sort of what's going on on this on the board, the satellite in terms of voltages and currents and uh, spin rates, etc. There's also a possibility of something that small to take pictures. This is taken from a Raspberry Pi uh, on one of our colleagues' um, satellites. High resolution uh, pictures are very difficult to send down, so we actually send them in chunks. And we have a set of ground stations around the world, which actually are amateur radio operators, will actually collect that data for us. Next slide, please. Uh, on board this particular satellite, we're going to be taking a radiation counter, amongst uh, other things. And we're transmitting at about four different frequencies, all coordinated with the um, International Organization for Amateur Radio. Next slide, please. That's it. Thank you. I have to say you're all very well behaved and well timed. I'm loving this. Do you want some more knowledge for your ear holes? Yes. Yeah. Never mind. Unfortunately, I don't have any of that. But uh, I've got some nonsense for you. Hello EMF, are you having a good time? Uh, my name is Sam and uh, I did this. For, so I made this hat for EMF 2022 and I found myself explaining to many people what I'd done, how it worked and I was basically writing a lightning talk in my head so I, now here we are and I can tell you all about it. Uh, it's mostly made together from a load of stuff that you can buy off eBay. Uh, this white hat was actually supposed to be a prototype um, but by the time I glued everything together and got it working, it had made it into production. Uh, because I have a much nicer smoked acrylic 
uh, hard hat. But making a, in, in retrospect, making a prototype is utterly ridiculous, because then I have two of these, <laughs> which is arguably too, too many. Um, so I glued the, uh, the, the string of lights all over this with the hot glue gun. I stuck on two or three of them backwards, because I'm stupid. Uh, uh, there's hot glue all around the room, uh, a common uh, theme for many of us, I'm sure, during EMF time. Uh, and then I wired the Pi up to the battery, it's all down here, making this a thing you would absolutely not want to try to take through an airport. <laughs> um, it's entirely safe, it's, there's a battery, there's a Pi, there's a bunch of wires. Um, right, so this is where the good stuff happens. So, uh, we need to map the lights in 3D space. We need to take 400 very precise photos of the hat. We need to find a way of mounting the hat and the camera a fixed distance apart and very square on. Did I use Lego? Of course I used Lego. Let me say this. This is uh, laid out. This is, exact. this is 56 studs apart. It's all very um, technical, as you can see. The Thor image underneath was the biggest flat thing I could find. Uh, uh, but it all works. So we have to um, run a little script that lights up one of the lights, uh, takes, a, takes a picture, lights the next light, takes a picture, lights the next light, takes 100 pictures. We turn the hat through 90 degrees. We do all that again, again, and again. We've then got all four sides of the hat and a bunch of images. We run them through uh, OpenCV, which detects basically does bright spot detection. Uh, so each image should have one bright spot, and we just um, map them. We get these little blobs of JSON for each image, which is nice. We only get two. Uh, axes per image because um, of the way that we need, to, you know, it's three-dimensional. Uh, and we run it through some, uh, turn those bits of JSON into some YAML, which looks like this, which is all very nice. Uh, so these are the exact coordinates of each uh, pixel uh, in kind of image space, and that works out very well. Some of them are fractional because we got multiple images, and uh, maybe you could tell the uh, rig wasn't very stable. Uh, 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 but some of them only had two coordinates. After all, all these images, I analyzed them all, ran it all through the scripts. The scripts were terrible, but it mostly worked. Only, uh, so for some of these uh, lights, I only had two, co two coordinates. Turns out that doesn't matter. As long as you've got most of the coordinates, you can uh, basically stick blue tag onto the faulty light. In the Python console, light up the lights that are nearest to it and work out where it is. And it's not a terrible hack because it worked. <laughs> Right? Uh, don't ask to see the code. Uh, so then we get some lovely uh, metadata like this. This is, this is now mapped in like minus one to one, uh, cross and uh, in all three axes. Uh, we can also work out the angle for each pixel using some barely remembered uh, trigonometry. Um, so that's all very nice. So now we have a nice map of the hat. Uh, I can't remember what's next. Right, so uh, this, this is all inspired by this video, which is really good. Matt Parker draped 500 neopixels over a Christmas tree and map them uh, in 3D space. Basically, without this, I wouldn't have known where to start. This is really good. Go and watch this. Uh, right, so the, um, the, the NeoPixels present themselves as a Python list. You can just set, you know, set the first uh, index of the list to uh, RGB triple, and it lights up, boom. And that's lovely, but it's kind of intuitive, but it leads you down a dark path. Uh, so this time we're using HSV, uh, which is a much smoother way to think about colors, because with the RGB, you've got a lot of fiddly maths to fade between colors. HSV, it's a circle. Red is here, green is here, blue is here. And you just go around, and Python knows how to convert between the two, and it's really nice. So if you're ever doing anything like this, I recommend stay away from RGBs. We don't, it basically doesn't know what the RGB is until the last second when we actually light up the lights. It's much easier to think about HSV. Uh, right, so, I, I bought a microphone off of eBay, this little cheap little thing here, uh, and I assumed that if I pretended for long enough to understand fast Fourier transforms, that I just would, right? <laughs> and it would just work. Uh, now, I'm th the thing is, it does, like, is this working? Can you see it? Like, this, is the color changing as the, with the sound? Right, and it, so it kind of works. In my head, it was like jumping up and down to a kick drum, right? It doesn't quite do that. This might be because I bought a shit microphone, but I think it's more likely that I absolutely half-assed the FFT. So if anybody knows how, anything about FFT transformations, uh, please come and find me, and I'll show you my terrible code. Um, so it turns out a hat is basically, it's, 
It's only coincidental that it's wrapped around a hat. It's a string of lights. So you can use basically this, these things that we have up there are running the same code. These uh, panels that was in the back of the car on the way here saying EMF camp, this little cube bit, this string of lights, this up at Hat Village, all running the same code. Uh, so a hat doesn't have to be a hat. And so what have we learned from doing this? You should absolutely do this. Because it, I, or something equally stupid. Because in my regular job, I'm an ops engineer, right? I, I don't know anything about this. Now I have lots of new opinions about lots of exciting things. <laughs> uh, which is always fulfilling and something to argue about. Uh, so yeah, it's totally do it. Uh, also, pay attention when you're gluing on your LED so some of them don't go on backwards. And maybe don't buy the cheapest microphone off eBay. And that's me. Thank you. <laughs> I honestly think the saw is more of a hindrance at this point. Okay, next up we have Thrifty Inc. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Henry, um, or Prehensile on the internet. Um, this is a little project that um, started, as many projects did, I think, uh, during lockdown. Um, during lockdown, I developed a rich and extensive collection of imaginary hobbies. Um, <laughs> hands up if you too developed an imaginary hobby during lockdown. Uh, it's all the research and none of the actual doing. Um, in this case, the, uh, the imaginary hobby was printmaking. Uh, I got really into printmaking. I kind of understand it all, except I never actually did any of it. Uh, because it turns out, um, I'm going to go back, because it turns out that print, uh, actually to do printmaking properly in a non-imaginary way is very expensive and very time consuming. This, like, the actual like, tight, uh, letterpress uh, presses and all of that sort of stuff goes for a lot of money on eBay. You need to do quite a lot of training to understand how to use it. Um, so that got filed away in the back of my brain somewhere and I moved on to other things. Uh, then at the last EMF, uh, 22, uh, I encountered this, which is two tin cans by Susie Devi. I think it should be here this year. I haven't seen it around. Maybe she's still setting it up or something, but it should be here this year as well. It's a printmaking studio in a letterbox. Uh, letterbox? In a postbox. Um, and phone box. Thank you. I am a clever man. Um, so yes, in a box, uh, but it's, you can make these tiny little prints in it and it's brilliant. And uh, Susie did a talk where she talks about how she does her printing with wood blocks that she laser cut. And a light bulb went off in my head and I went, I've got access to a laser cutter. I, 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 so uh, that summer, uh, the summer, that winter, I uh, made my first prints. Um, this was a Christmas card which came out like that. And I was quite happy with that. That was my first laser cut wood block print. And you know, it, it turned into it's quite a nice thing. Um, and then I realized that um, the letters don't have to be fixed, right? So that is, that is like, I can only print ho, ho, ho with that, which is a nice Christmas card, but it's not movable type. It's not letterpress. Then I realized you could actually make loads of tiny laser cut letters, and you could actually do like, proper actual letterpress. Well, not proper actual letterpress, a really DIY janky version of letterpress. But the point is, it's not super uh, expensive because I'm just laser cutting bits of ply for this. And because I'm laser cutting bits of ply down the hack space, I can sort of just do it in whenever I have free time. It's not like the t big kind of time consuming thing that proper letterpress would be. So I was pretty happy with this. Obviously, I've just sort of engineered my way into a trap. Um, but the first, this is the very first print that I ever pulled off it, and it, you know, it comes out, it's come out pretty nice. Like, I was pretty pleased with this. Um, I then sort of went off down a little bit of a rabbit hole um, because I, I, I decided to make life difficult for myself. I decided I wanted to try and print onto postcards like, that already had images on them. Uh, it turns out that's really hard because you need like special ink. P postcards are glossy, the ink doesn't stick to it. You end up with sort of not very great prints. Um, so I sort of wasted a bit of time trying to make that work properly and non-disappointingly. Um, and then I stopped doing that um, and I made a new typeface which is slightly bigger than these little... Ooh. <laughs> it's not doing anything now. 
Okay, well, anyway, I, th that was the last slide. So, uh, <laughs> so I made a new typeface. It's much easier to print with it, and I got back into making uh, like prints like the first one I showed you. I have gave up on the glossy stuff. I started making posters, and this is where we currently are. This print I pulled this afternoon uh, in the camper van that we're parking in, um, so I'm pretty pleased with that. It's something that's done in the field. Um, that's about it. I am going to... Um, open source all of my plans and stuff when it's actually in like a stable state, so you, you too can do your own laser cut uh, letterpress printing. I also have some of the bits and pieces over there in that corner, so if anyone is interested to sort of come and have a look and see uh, what this particular rabbit hole has created and maybe make a print of your own, uh, come and find me afterwards. And that's me. I'll just, I'll, I'll just press the button. A button, anyway. Which button? Right. That button? There Page we go. Advanced. Last but not least, watch the skies. Yes. Hello. Uh, I'm James. Uh, rather too many of you know me, which is a bit worrying, considering uh, what I'm about to talk about, because I, I've done a whole bunch of public speaking, uh, I really enjoy doing it, and this is terrifying, because I, I had to kind of blackmail myself into doing this. Uh, so you'll see why, because this talk is about UFOs. Does anybody remember this book? I love this book so much. They brought out a, a reprinted version of it, uh, and I have it on my shelf, and it's such a wonderful thing. Um, it's probably got a lot of things to answer for in terms of me and my, I don't know, me, um, along with Douglas Adams and things like that. Um, but the, the talk is about, things are a bit different. When I was a kid, it was all this sort of thing. It was, you know, a bit silly. It, it was all out, um, you know, stories of mad people out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, seeing things, and it was like, well, that's, that's just all made up. It's changing. The, the US establishment and other governments around the world seem to be admitting that there are things in the sky that they don't know what they are, which is weird. In, why, why would they? Yeah. We have quotes like this. This is from Marco Rubio, who was the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee at the time, which is one of the eight people in the uh, US government who are actually briefed on everything. We have things flying over military installations, military exercises and other places, and we don't know what it is, and it isn't ours. And in many cases, exhibits attributes of the kinds of technology we haven't seen before. Which is weird. This one's too long to read, but similar kind of thing. This one's actually in Congress, as uh, a hearing from the Director of National Intelligence. Um, there are multiple sensors picking things up. They've been seen by pilots that we don't have the technology for traveling at speeds that exceed the sound barrier without the sonic boom. And this is the fun bit. Technologies we don't have and that, frankly, we're not capable of defending against. This is somebody, Director of National Intelligence, saying this in Congress in the US. So, uh, another one, Deputy Director here in a, a similar hearing. The majority of many of the observations we have are physical objects from the sensor data. We haven't had a collision, but we have had at least 11 near misses. That seems a bit more than weird lights. Uh, we have some stuff from Mitt Romney saying, uh, you know, that there is a technology that we don't understand. and adversaries aren't there, and neither are we. So, there seems to be this admission that there are things there that we don't know what they are. Um, and you've got pilots describing these things, uh, lots of military reports, things like that. You have Barack Obama, uh, who I believe we may have heard of uh, on TV. I had to bleep out uh, James Corden's name, <laughs> just because... Um, saying quite clearly, 
you know, prefix actually by the bit I left off, which is, and I'm not joking here, there is footage and records of objects in the skies. We don't know what they are. We don't know how they moved. We just don't know. So there's something going on. Um, one of the best modern cases, I mean, it's 20 years old now, but modern-ish, in the, the kind of this century at least, multiple F-18 pilots who are people who are incredibly highly trained, who see, um, who have seen these things. Uh, they've been tracked on radar from the most advanced radar systems, doing impossible moving of accelerations. They've been seen visually, and a little quote from one of the pilots here, when he uh, flew over to find out what one was, and he actually got engaged in it, circling around it, it circling back around him. Oh God, I'm engaged, I'm engaged. Oh shit. Which, that coming from somebody who is a pilot of a multi-billion pound aircraft, you have to take seriously. So, the terminology is changing a bit. It's changing from UFO, because that's loaded, to UAP, Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena. Um, and there's more and more stuff going on. There's people standing up under oath. This is actually the pilot who engaged the thing and the Nimitz encounter, uh, David Fravor. There are other uh, people uh, coming out talking about this stuff. This was last year, uh, a whole bunch of people under oath in Congress uh, talking about this stuff. There's still a lot of bullshit in this. You will note that I have not talked about what these things might be, where it might, you know, all, all that stuff, because there's a lot of woo around there, and you have to be really careful to avoid it. And some of these people are not the most trustworthy. You know, I don't want to be listening to Marco Rubio on too many things. Um, but it is bipartisan, which is one of the strangest things in the US at the moment. They don't work together, except on this. Uh, so that's odd. And whenever I do come across the woo, and it all, I think, actually, no, wait a minute, it's still a bit stupid. I think back to when, in 1990, I was a kid. It was the winter, it was dark, I was doing a paper round, and I was walking up here, up this little road, in the middle of the night, not the middle of the night, middle of the evening, and it's dark. And I saw this. That is a bunch of trees, that is a big black thing can't really tell how big because it's just against a black sky lights on the underneath drifting slowly over the top of the trees um, and yep I'm near there like that the fun thing is my mum also saw it as she was coming to pick me up so I can at least think back to that and go well there's something real there, and we shall find out what it is. All right, thank you very much. That is our lineup for this afternoon. Keep it going for, you heard, EMX, EBMX. Thank you, Plus, Exploring Heart Space, Thrift the Egg, and Watch the Sky. Thank you so much. Uh, I have been Thor, the God of Thunder. Uh, if you would like to continue your banquet of bite-sized information, we are back here, 12.30 tomorrow. Hope to see some of you there. Enjoy the rest of your EMF. Thank you. Goodbye.